Hi, uh, it's good to be here. Is my brother in the room somewhere? Oh, uh, that's my brother. Um, so if you have any difficult questions at the end, then please direct them to Paul Coman, not Julian Coman. He'll be happy to deal with them. Um, so what I want to do uh, today is give you, I hope anyway, a bit of an insight into an industry which you're all very interested in, you're studying, and I'm presuming that a lot of you will be thinking about trying to kind of make your way in it yourself. And it's an industry which is, uh, well, one way of putting it would be to say it's transforming. In actual fact, a revolution is going on, and it's alarming, exciting, full of innovations, full of possibilities, uh, and just a little frightening for those people involved in it. And I hope I'm going to explain all of those aspects in a way as we go on. Um, but I'd like to start uh, not in 2012, but in 1992, uh, when some of you uh, may not yet have been born, but, uh, well, I was around. Um, just to kind of give you a, an idea of the year that we're talking about, and this will be the most surprising thing that I say in my talk. In 1992, Leeds United were the English Football League champions. I'll just repeat that so it sinks in. Leeds United were the English League football, first division football champions. John Major was prime minister. Nirvana, their album Nevermind, that had just gone to number one in the album charts. It was a different time and place. And I found myself, um, and I hope the reasons eventually will become clear why I'm telling you this story. I found myself back in Knaresborough, North Yorkshire, after three years living in Italy, where I'd been doing um, a PhD, which sadly remains unfinished to this day. Um, I'd returned after a three, my three-year grant had expired. People were losing faith in me. Went back home to Knaresborough, where my mother had bought me a wooden desk. And that desk was very empty. It stared at me. And that was the desk on which I was going to finish my PhD. Um, as that extremely depressing autumn uh, carried on, it became increasingly clear to me that I wasn't making what one might call headway with my PhD. I had a friend who worked at a newspaper called The European. Um, she worked on the news desk there. So I was in touch with her, kind of, as a matter of course anyway. Um, and I suggested, more to kind of distract myself from academic work than anything, that I might try and write an article for them um, for this paper. I'd never really thought of being a journalist. I, I thought I was going to be an academic. Um, but I had an idea to write an article about Florence's football club. I'd been living in Florence in Italy. They had a club called Fiorentina, have a club called Fiorentina, who had done very well that season. They'd qualified for European competition. And they had a, an owner who was also a filmmaker. So it's Fiorentina, get the Oscars, was my fairly appalling journalistic trope that I decided to go for. Anyway, Julie said, well, why don't you write it? And I'll tell the sports editor that it's coming. So I did write it. In fact, I wrote it out in longhand, because I didn't have a computer, didn't have a typewriter. So wrote it out, and then there were lots of crossings out and so on. So I had to go back and make what we would call in those days a fair copy. Then I got on the bus and went from Knaresborough to Harrogate and found a lady in Harrogate who advertised, advertised in the Yellow Pages uh, her typing services. Took round my piece of paper. She, as I sat on her sofa, typed it all out. Took the typewritten copy, got an envelope, put it in an envelope, bought a stamp, sent the letter, addressed it, obviously, to the sports editor, the European, uh, London. Uh, off went the letter. And, well, actually, a few days later, I got a call from the sports editor. And he said that he liked the piece. And it turned out that they got an Italian sports paper called La Gazzetta della Sport uh, every day. Uh, and no one could read it, because no one spoke Italian. So the sports editor su suggested that if I came down to London, I could come in one day a week. They'd give me 50 quid to read all their, their Gazzetta della Sport. And that's how I got started, really, in journalism. Now, if I today were to send a typewritten article in an envelope to the sports editor of any paper, then that 
the arrival of that envelope would be the cause of considerable laughter wherever it happened to land. Um, it was a different world, a completely different world. And of course, the thing that changed, the thing that rendered all those things, handwritten pieces of paper, envelopes, women in Harrogate who type out things, the thing that rendered all that redundant was the arrival of the internet. Uh, one definition of the internet, which comes from an article in the, written by Emily Bell and Clay Shirky, uh, it's in the, well, it was published in the Columbia Journalism School's journal. Uh, their definition of the internet, um, well, I'll just read it out to you. Uh, then came the internet, whose basic logic, digital replication, universally available, with no division of participants into producers and consumers, is at odds with the organizing principles of news production as it has existed since the 1600s. So a change of centuries of practice, in a sense, arrived post-1992 and changed everything. Did it change it for the better? Well, certainly in terms of our lives, I don't think any of us would want to go back. The means of communication, the mean, means of human contact, social media, all that kind of stuff immeasurably enhance our everyday lives. What, however, did it do for newspapers? Well, it created a lot of problems, which I hope these few slides might illustrate. Um, so when we say the market, what we're talking about uh, the media, the newspaper market, the one that I came into. This section could also be headlined, The Veil of Tears. So newspaper total revenues, as you can see, all those lines, they're not telling you anything good. They're te telling you that newspaper revenue is going down and there's no prospect of it stopping going downwards. Print ad revenue. Well, advertisers, why would they want to place their ad in your newspaper? It would be because people are reading that newspaper. They think those people are in, your, in their particular constituency. They want to reach those people. Those people stop reading newspapers because they're going onto the internet, they're using their iPad, they're reading BBC News for free, they're getting their news from social networks. No ads will come. So print ad revenue going down. Declining circulations, for the reasons just mentioned, people are going elsewhere to get their news. They don't new need newspapers anymore. And as you can see, this isn't just a local phenomenon. Why would it be, given that the web is global? Across the world, the same thing is happening. The figures. Depressing. If you look at the Guardian there, from 2007 to 2011, that's a fairly vertiginous drop, 21%. Things will have got worse since 2011. Daily Telegraph, the same. The Independent, well, things are so bad there. That figure, incidentally, 82,000, 2011, that's more like 50,000 now. Things have got reached the stage at The Independent where they've decided to merge The Independent on Sunday with The Independent and merge that new paper with The Evening Standard. Um, the Evening Standard owns The Independent. So they're cost-cutting like mad at The Independent on Sunday. 20 journalists will lose their jobs there. The Times, you see what's happening there, the same process of downward fall in circulation. Things are also on, on the move there. They're going to merge the Sunday Times with The Times to cost-cut and save money. Uh, Sunday Telegraph, I worked for the Sunday Telegraph um, from 1999 to 2004. When I joined the Sunday Telegraph, I remember that the big aim, the big target, and this is only kind of 13 years ago, uh, was to get over the one million mark. No one's really talking about that anymore. So across the board, it looks fairly disastrous. Non, well, to sum up, really, non-digital revenues are declining. Job ads, print, um, jobs ads, other kinds of ads, they're not turning up. Content revenue is going down. People aren't buying the papers. 
print display ink including sponsorship, the whole economy of newspapers after the arrival of the web is in a tailspin, it would seem. So, what the hell's going to happen? Well, the great hope is that having passed through the veil of tears, we will come out and see the sunny uplands of digital revenue. Now, you'll note that the years we're talking about here, 12, 30, 15, 16, so it hasn't happened. These are predictions. These are estimations. These are, in actual fact, the expression of a simple hope that think that the money is going to come from digital now that it's not coming through ads, people buying papers in the same way, and so on. And the various bits of digital that are mentioned on here, I'll just briefly talk about uh, brand extension. So, for instance, The Guardian, how can it make money given that people aren't buying papers in the same way? One way it's, that it's doing, which you may have heard of, you may even have been on one, is something called The Guardian Masterclass. That's so you get a specialist, and it might be a cartoonist, someone with another specialism, photography. You pay quite a lot of money to go and get a masterclass. You go to King's Place, where The Guardian and The Observer are based, and you have a day's classes with this expert, often a very famous, famous person in their field. Other ways are organizing debates, getting the brand out there in other ways. GIA stands for Guardian in America. Um, a hell of a lot of money has been pumped by The Guardian into setting up, I think, 17 journalists and production staff around that, all in New York, all going out, out with their families. That's all with the aim and the hope that America is such a huge market that online hits can reach such a level in America that ads will follow and money can be made through The Guardian, as it were, going global or at least going, in America, going American. Is that going to work as a new means of raising revenue? They're also planning to do the same thing uh, with Australia. We'll discuss later whether we think it's going to work. The other great innovation is the move to interactive journalism. This is the other way, or this is the other way that journalism has been transformed. So we're in a new world. We're no longer, let's say, for the purposes of argument, in a print world. We're in an interactive world. What can be done in that world? How can things be made so interesting in that world that people, more and more people get engaged and it becomes a working model? So the various ways that this can be done involve, well, basically very, very interesting and interactive graphics which draw people in. This is to do with the Arab Spring. It basically provides a way through of finding, by dropping the cursor on certain points, getting access to how the Arabs being developed at various points along the way. You can read the journalism that happened in relation to Egypt or Tunisia at the time. It's an invaluable study tool, and so on. But more super duper graphics, which are very, very cool in many ways. This, these, are, these two are Olympics related, so racing against history. That was the uh, Olympics 100 meters final, but what this did was have a kind of virtual final. So you were able to compare every competitor in every Olympics in the swimming 100 meters and find out, for instance, where Mark Spitz would have come. Um, similarly, with the 100 meters, uh, the men's 100 meters race, throughout history, you can find out who would have finished where. So where would Carl Lewis have come in relation to Alan Wells in 1980, and so on and so forth. All, uh, uh, that's kind of more of the same kind of idea. Oh, and Catherine's going to actually show you the 100 meter race in action. Just how fast was Usain Bolt's gold medal sprint? Let's put him on a slightly bigger stage and see him race against every Olympic medalist since 1896. This imaginary race, assembled using runners' average speeds, reveals just how much faster sprinters have become. A few lanes over, we see another Usain Bolt, who dominated the field in Beijing in 2008. Almost 10 feet back, Carl Lewis, gold medalist in Seoul in 1988. He won in 1984, too, one of just a handful of sprinters on this track twice. 
As we go further back in time, we pass more of the fastest sprinters in history. Jim Hines, the first man to break 10 seconds in the Olympics. Jesse Owens, who won four golds in Berlin in 1936. Archie Hahn, the Milwaukee Meteor, who won three events in 1904. And finally, near the end of this track, we have Tom Burke, who won in Athens in 1896. His time, 12 seconds, puts him more than 60 feet behind today's winner. So what can we take away from this picture? For one, a lot of these sprinters are from the US. Although Americans have had a rivalry with British sprinters, and, more recently, Caribbean athletes, nearly half of these runners are Americans. But we can also see that glory is fleeting. Repeat performances are rare. There's been a new winner on the podium in all but three Olympics. But to get a little bit more perspective, let's see how some of America's best young sprinters would fit into this group. Here are the fastest kids at the 100 meter dash at different ages, as recorded by the Amateur Athletic Association. Obviously, they're way behind today's athletes. But they're not as far behind as you might expect. America's fastest eight-year-old did the 100 meter dash in 13 and a half seconds, which would have put him less than a second off third place in 1896. Not bad for grade school. And the record for 15 to 16 year olds is a 10.27. Good enough for a bronze as recently as 1980. Still, it's not like those Olympians were slow. Despite more than a century of improvements in nutrition, fitness, footwear, and track surfaces, the difference between today's athletes and the fastest humans of the 19th century? Just about three seconds. impressive stuff. So what you're seeing there is a gradual realization that despite all these problems of the old newspaper economy and model collapsing, there are immense new possibilities opening up online. And that graphic is one illustration of it, that have immense possibilities. They show a way forward that could be extremely exciting. And another dimension of that way forward is the transition from old-style newsprint to live journalism, as it's called. That really is another way of saying that suddenly journalism has become alive with all kinds of interactive possibilities. If you think of the way that social media works, if you think of Twitter, if you think of Facebook, if you think of blogging, all these ways of essentially self-publishing, of replying in real time to something that's come up that morning, a debate started, you intervene. There are no gatekeepers to that process. Suddenly, anyone's taking part. It's almost a free-for-all. And so one of the ways that certainly The Guardian and The Observer and others have been attempting to exploit this new world is by developing what's known as live journalism, which is basically using the knowledge of the crowd, using crowdsourcing, using people, people's experiences in real time to inform newspaper coverage in the way that it never did before. A few examples. Uh, hang on, what's after this one? A few examples. So covering events as they happen, we've got a reporter called Paul Lewis who won uh, Reporter of the Year at the British Press Awards uh, a couple of years ago, I think. He developed a means of networking with crowds, with people in various situations, which enabled all kinds of access to events. And in particular, there was one famous incident. Do you remember the newspaper seller, uh, Ian Tomlinson, who was at the Occupy, uh, or the anti-G8 riots? He was hit by a policeman um, for no reason at all, really. He was walking away from that policeman, subsequently collapsed and died. In the old world, one could very easily imagine that being the subject of a newspaper report and not much more. But in the new world, what happened was that a bystander who saw that happen, who saw Ian Tomlinson fall to the ground after being hit by a policeman, sent in, well, he filmed the incident, sent the film to Paul Lewis. Paul Lewis corroborated that film with other accounts through crowdsourcing of what had taken place 
to Ian Tomlinson. And as a result of that, a huge online momentum was, build, was built up. And that incident was reconstructed in such a way that eventually a policeman was convicted for that assault on Ian Tomlinson, who, obviously, who had subsequently died. Another example, Ian Blair, do you remember 2005, London bombings? So Ian Blair, in the immediate aftermath of the bombs going off on the tubes in London, appeared on television to say uh, that, both, well, I think his exact phrase was electronic faults had caused crashes on the London Underground, that's what was happening. Immediately, he was contradicted in multiple online ways. Within half an hour, he was back on TV saying, in actual fact, he'd been completely wrong and the terrorist attack was taking place. That one of the things that was immediately posted online that immediately contradicted his version of events was a picture of the London bus which had been blown up and the roof was off, if you so, in all kinds of ways, the traditional lines of authority were breaking down because people saw or were first-hand witnesses of events and they were able immediately to communicate what they saw. That's something that papers or on their online versions can use in a way that was never possible for before. They can use that information. Another example, Occupy Wall Street. You remember uh, the protests against the 1% that took place in America. Um, uh, so Wall Street, uh, their equivalent of the stock exchange, was occupied by protesters. The first news of that event was news produced by the protesters themselves who were blogging, publishing photos of the protests taking place. They were, as it were, in control of their own news event. Again, totally unprecedented. There can be dangers to this, obviously. Now that there are no gatekeepers, how do you judge, how do you adjudicate as a journalist between what's coming to you, between what you're being sent if you're someone like Paul Lewis? There was a kind of famous or, should I say, notorious incident in the Guardian newsroom uh, about a year and a half ago, I think. No, maybe two years ago. It involves a uh, Syrian lesbian blogger who was writing all kinds of incendiary stuff about the uh, experience of Syrian women, of attitudes towards homophobia. For The Guardian, this was gold dust. It ticked you know, any number of boxes that uh, you would wish to be ticked. And she appeared on the front page. She appeared inside. She sparked endless comment pieces about what she'd said. Some days later, it transpired that the Syrian lesbian blogger was in fact a middle-aged married American man living in Scotland <laughs> who had, for, presumably for his own amusement, scammed the Guardian big time and made it look rather foolish. So there are dangers of authentication there are, and all these things are now being taught in newsrooms or if they're not being taught they should be taught. But that shouldn't, those dangers shouldn't be overstated and above all we shouldn't lose sight of the enormous possibilities that interactive journalism can now give. So that's just a kind of brief summary of them really, covering events as they happen so in real time, like the protester who was there at Ian Toml when Ian Tomlinson was assaulted, immediate and reactive, the same kind of thing, multiple sources for stories, crowdsourcing, and maybe this is the important point from exceptional to commonplace. It, this is now part of what journalists do. It's an everyday part of their lives. It's no longer something that's out of the ordinary in any way. We'll leave question seven maybe for later because that's quite a profound question. And when journalists are scurrying about doing live blogs, um, minute by minute journalism getting contradicted, updated, every hour of the day, the story's changing every hour of the day, it's no longer a product that you produce overnight and appears the next day. That can be a very confusing, tiring, distracting world. How do you maintain levels of distance in order to reflect and present with judgment when things are happening literally from minute to minute? It's a big problem.
Alan Rusbridge's rules of open journalism. Um, so the Guardian and the Observer have tried to be at the for forefront of taking on all the kinds of challenges which I've been describing, the move from print to online, the move to interactive, how you interact, how you maintain processes of judgment and discrimination in that context. But Alan Russell, well, perhaps the biggest advocate, advocate of the move online is Alan Rusbridge. He, by the way, I'm sure you know, is the uh, editor in chief of The Guardian and The Observer. So you can read them there. It encourages participation, interactive journalism and open journalism. It invites and or allows a response. It's not inert, us to them form of publishing. It's not top down. So m what I write as a journalist is informed by, maybe I've tweeted to ask for information about a certain subject. Maybe I've picked up a story on Facebook or a debate that's happening on Facebook and I interact with the people who are making that story run on Facebook and that becomes a story online or even in the paper. Helps from communities of joint interest around subjects, issues or individuals, open to the web. It links to and collaborates, i.e. with Facebook, with other material, including services on the web. Aggregates and curates the work of others. Recognises that journalists are not the only voices of authority, expertise and interest. Remember the guy who sent the video film in uh, to Paul Lewis. That led Paul Lewis to win a journalistic prize, but you know, the guy was a, just a guy who has, was attending the demonstration, an amateur in inverted commas. Recognises that publishing can be the beginning of the journalistic process rather than the end, so open to feedback from people. Transparent and open to challenge, including correction, just as Ian Blair had to correct. So, oh, sorry. Well spotted. So just as Ian Blair, oh, bloody hell. Well, I've now dismantled it, so sorry, just give me, give me a, a bit of it. I haven't got an appropriate jumper for this. Right, there we go. So, yeah, correction, clarification, and addition in the same way that Ian Blair had to correct his version of events after the London bombings. So, what's the problem with all that? Well, there's no problem at all, obviously, with democratizing news, with using crowds, with being interactive, with being open. It's a revolution, but it's clearly a positive revolution. It gets more people engaged. It gets more people using, in an interactive way, this online resource, which has come out of nowhere in the mid-1990s via Tim Berners-Lee. The problem is, though, where is the money coming from? Now, if you remember, print journalism, circulation going through the floor, advertising going through the floor. The Guardian and Observer last year lost 50 million pounds. And it's only going to get worse. Digital advertising, you remember that graph that we saw of 2014-15? Apparently, di digital advertising is going to grow at a rate which will partially offset the decline of print advertising, but it hasn't happened yet, and no one knows how it's going to happen. So where is the money going to come from? No consensus. Well, yeah, you could kind of rewrite that as no one has any idea. Paywall. The Times has a paywall. Uh, obviously, the idea of a paywall is that you kind of replicate what you did when you were producing newspapers in the old era. So you have to pay a monthly subscription to view the Times. At the moment, I'm not sure of the exact figure, but it's not a great deal of money. But not nearly enough people have taken up that option. Why should they? When they can get news free on the BBC, they can also get news free at The Guardian and The Observer. They can get news free in myriad other ways, as I'm sure all of you are aware, and a lot of you actually do. So a paywall 
is a kind of conservative option and doesn't seem to be working out. The alternative, obviously, is no paywall. And that, to be frank, isn't really working out either. This obviously performs a comparison of the New York Times and the Guardian. Um, but the big thing to kind of point out there really is the BBC, the role of the BBC. It's saying that the New York Times hasn't got an equivalent in America. So the New York Times is enacting forms of paywalls. But because it hasn't got an online competitor of such size that's just giving things out for free, um, it's in a different position. Papers in Britain do, and they have the BBC to compete with, which is a big argument against a paywall. So in this extremely confusing, quite exciting, maybe depressing, maybe uplifting world, there are, though, some givens, one could say. Print is in structural decline. That all the graphs that we saw demonstrate that. Newspaper organizations are no longer broadcasters. The future is social and open. This transition that we've been describing to a world where the relationship between journalists and their readers is completely different. It's not hierarchical. It's not around a closed world where a newspaper is made and delivered the next day to a consumer. It's an interactive world in which it's sometimes hard to say who's the journalist and who's the consumer. That's here to stay. Being on all major platforms is a must-have. That requires investment. All major platforms, well, obviously mobile is the big coming one, That's, which is going to be perhaps the major way in which people consume their news in the future. But it requires investment. And as we've seen, there are huge financial problems. Where's, that, where's the money for that investment going to come from? The opportunity globally for branded digital content business remains, requires investment too. This constant return to the idea of investment should be kind of sing signaling alarm bells because we don't know where the money's going to come from, really. So that's a kind of snapshot of the world that I'm in and that you might be in, or that at the very least you're studying. Where are things going to go in the future? How is this apparently kind of very complex set of problems going to be resolved? There are three kind of broad schools. And remember, remember go back to that phrase, no consensus. There is no consensus. School one would say it's a kind of creative chaos school of thinking. And it, it's an optimistic school of thinking as well. It basically says that we are now in a world where old style gatekeeping institutions have gone in the sense that they used to exist. They'll never come back in that form again. And we're in a new world in which anyone can publish. You can set up a blog on what the hell you like, what you're interested in. There was a blog in America that started up called SCOTUS. And it's, it started up analyzing forensically judgments by the Supreme Court in America. It had a, a landmark breakthrough moment. It was, by the way, it was set up not by journalists, by two lawyers. It had a breakthrough moment when Obama's health care bill was being discussed. Very controversial in America. Everyone was interested in that. A particular amendment, which was to do with individual health care packages, was passed by the Supreme Court. But this, the judgment was so complicated that CNN, the big institution, the, the big, well, a huge organization, actually called the decision wrong. It misunderstood the judgment of the Supreme Court. They had to rapidly revise it, of course. Meanwhile, SCOTUS, this blog set up by two law lawyers, not only called the decision absolutely correct at the same time, it provided a wealth of information and insight. And within a week, there were about a million people looking at this blog. That blog has since become the go-to blog for understanding the Supreme Court from all kinds of networks who have fight, 
sorry, who have given the money. Where's that? Sorry, old technology. Um, that, so, so successful has that blog been that they've been given the money to basically continue and expand. So why not replicate that in other worlds? Why not individually publish and see where that goes? Somehow a market will emerge in which you'll find sponsors. It's going to be different. We don't know how it's going to be, but we'll get there in terms of the financing. School two is the more conservative with a small c approach. And there's a kind of phrase that one could use, which is speed bumps on the internet. Another way of saying that is keeping people out, saying you can't come into this content. Obviously, paywalls is part of that. And this school of thought argues that the only way to go is to get, construct those paywalls, maybe make them sophisticated so you can get in some parts, not in other parts. Maybe getting in that part leads you to want to get into a part for which you have to pay. Studying those techniques, that's the way to go, i.e. non-open, or at least a very partial form of openness. And the third way, I guess, is a kind of combination of the two, a middle way, which sees institutions like The Guardian, The Observer, The Times, The Telegraph. They're no longer the, sorry. <laughs> they're no longer the repositories of all this information and authority. They're no longer the place which delivers news to you. That's not coming back but they can still exist as centers of authority, but they have to form partnerships with, say, a blog like SCOTUS, which specializes in the law, with crowds who are attending certain demonstrations. They need to use all those resources, create alliances. The Guardian has uh, its development coverage online is partially funded by the Bill Gates Foundation. Now, that's fine, getting money from the Bill Gates Foundation, but to what extent will that then compromise what you do? What if Bill Gates, or at least his foundation, wants to focus on some things rather than others? What's happened to your editorial independence? So there's all kinds of things to be negotiated there. But this kind of third way would see the news organization at the center of a kind of constellation of bloggers, other organizations, academics in universities, and if you form and establish those networks effectively, then that can work for you. And forms of income will come through sponsorship and the sheer kind of depth of interest in particular facets of what you're doing. So maybe. Um, so those are the three possible ways forward in a situation where we've got no consensus. But I thought I'd just end with a kind of plea in a way for recognizing just how important newspapers and media organizations are and how bad it would be to lose some characteristics that they possess. And I wanted to use the example of the story that we had in the Observer um, on Sunday, which you may have seen, you may not have seen. Actually, quick question, how many people here read a daily newspaper? Buy, a, buy and read a daily newspaper. So you read the print version, yeah? So, wow, well, that was about a third. How many get their, all their news online? All, that's all then, you're right. So a good two thirds to three quarters get everything online. How many people, sorry, last question. How many people pay for what they get online in news terms? One. What do you, what do you pay for? Uh, the Guardian. The Guardian. Oh, right, you get a, what, the digital package? Right, all oh, right, so you've gone, right, well done. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so there'll be a special prize for you at the end, actually. <laughs> so this weekend at the Observer, our front page story was about um, the most senior Catholic in Britain, Cardinal Keith O'Brien. And who, just before coming in here, I heard, has actually resigned um, as a result of that story. The story was that he had um, engaged in inappropriate acts with four priests in Scotland. He's been a very outspoken critic of homosexuality on theological grounds. Uh, he's been very out there in his opposition to that. 
Um, so obviously a great story, but it came on Friday night um, when some of us were already knackered after the week. So it was about eight o'clock. It came via the magazine editor, who's a Scottish guy called Rory Nicholl. He came over to me about eight o'clock in the evening and said, uh, how do you want your complete weekend disrupting? And obviously I didn't <laughs> at that stage. Um, and then he gave me a piece by a, the woman who wrote the piece called, called Catherine uh, Devaney, who I'd never heard of. Uh, she's a feature writer in Scotland, um, freelance. Uh, she normally does cultural stuff. For various reasons, she'd established over years a, a relationship with these priests. I mean, well, she knew one of them very well anyway. But obviously, I'd never heard of her. She'd come secondhand by Rory, and, she, and the story was that a cardinal has been engaging in inappropriate acts. The legal implications of that were obviously enormous and a libel case. Well, we've been talking about the financial problems that we face, that, that could have finished us in one fell swoop. So it had to be treated with a great deal of skepticism, basically. So get the bona fides of Catherine Devaney, who is she, kind of background checks on her, long conversations with her establishing that everything kind of stacked up in what she was saying about how she knew these priests, why the story had come this week and at this point. Then it involved the whole of Saturday being spent with the lawyer, um, Zoe. So there were probably five versions of the story that eventually appeared that were written, and then that was filtered out. Another aspect was filtered out. We could say this if we said it in that way. We couldn't do another piece on a separate page because it implied something else. All that process was a thought process of about 36 hours, which required the input of maybe five people who were professionally trained. Uh, without institu institutions which embody that kind of expertise, experience, it's very difficult to see how a story like that could, act, could have actually made it into, you know, you couldn't just blog that, or if you had done, we'd have ended up in a situation similar to the one that um, the wife of John Burkow, Sally Burkow, found, found herself in when she tweeted. you remember the tweet about Alistair McAlpine, uh, notorious now, and she's being sued for that. One could imagine that happening multiple times over if our only source of delivered news about the world, important news, this story about the Cardinal is a very important story for the Catholic Church. We need these kinds of institutions in some, health, in some form to survive into the future if those kinds of stories are gonna to continue to be broken, I think. So somehow, uh, we, or maybe you, since you're the next generation, need to solve the problem of how to fund it all. And that's, the, that's it. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Sure. And, uh, you came from an academic background. Yeah. Kind of, how did you find the transition from kind of academic writing and that kind of uh, level of detail and rigor to journalistic writing? I mean, did you find the disparity between those two? Um, well, I, I certainly found that it was a very different kind of writing. I mean, one of the first things that it took me a while to get my head around was that when you're writing an academic essay, it's a kind of basic principle that if you're doing a set of arguments, then your strongest argument comes at the end. So you build up cumulatively, and then you kind of hit them with the absolute clincher at the end. In journalism, it's the opposite, because you have no faith that anyone's going to read to the end. So you get your best, you get the kind of top stuff, the most important stuff, you say that immediately, and then it tends to tail away. It took me a long time to understand that really. In terms of rigor, I mean, it's a different kind of rigor that you have to, I mean, if you think of the potential nightmare of getting crucial facts wrong and those facts suddenly being out there and okay, online they can be changed back, 
back in the 1990s, that wasn't really the case. There was a kind of appalling error that was there, out there forever, that you were responsible for. Um, that, the rigor in terms of facts and getting things right was the most powerful impression maybe that I got from changing from academic work, which is all about opinions. Anyway. Um, when it comes to the new online media, which we're seeing now, uh, crowdsourcing, and yeah. very much social networks, what do you think will be the characteristics which will define a professional journalist from someone who's just trying to create uh, curated material? Yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, the, in some of the models that are being discussed, the, the journalist almost does emerge as a kind of curator of experience. For instance, there's um, a new kind of venture that The Guardian has just started. It's called Guardian Witness. And the idea of this is that a kind of assignment is set to ordinary members of the public, and it might be, you know, go and photograph summer holidays in Britain, I, I don't know, something like that. And so ordinary people go do that, they send their stuff through to, and the, the journalist role will be a curator, choosing the best photos, choosing the, how to arrange them. That's kind of one version of what being a journalist will be. And the, the problem is going to be, if the current financial position continues, how are you going to finance journalists to do the rather different jobs of beat reporting or going to courts or covering an area which, in, like crime in the north of England, which involves like not very much for quite a long time, but then quite a lot for a few weeks. How are you going to finance people doing that? Um, and I don't really know. I mean, a, a lot of what goes on now is curating. The, the Huffington Post, as I'm sure you're aware, is, is, you know, it aggregates, it takes stuff that's produced elsewhere and then prints it, you know, prints the set that selects what it wants from it, then does comment pieces on it. It's entirely derivative. But where's the infrastructure, the financial infrastructure, which is going to generate the money to pay the people to do the initial producing, which it then curates? Um, we don't really know, I don't think. Hi. Can you tell me about cultivation of sources and how far you would go to get a lead story like the uh, uh, front page about the car bridge? How far you'd go? Like what you'd, what you'd give to them and how, how you'd make sure that the Guardian or the Observer got the scoop rather than a competitor. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the one thing I didn't mention in that talk, I thought there was kind of enough with what we were discussing, but I didn't talk about Leveson. Um, and the Leveson inquiry is clearly, and the whole affair of the news of the world, hacking and so on, that's created a very different world in which how far people are prepared to go in general is probably a great deal less far than they were going in the past. Um, in terms of the Cardinal story, I mean, we would not have paid someone. We don't pay for stories. That's a a general principle. So had someone, so I had say one of the priests come to us and said, I can tell you everything about how Cardinal O'Brien has been misbehaving. Uh, if you give me a thousand quid, then we wouldn't have taken the story. So we wouldn't go as far as paying for anything like that. In terms of ethically, how far would you go? Then, especially post Leveson, there are you know, obviously one has to take decisions based on a judgment. In this case, the judgment, the cardinal, the judgment would have been, is this in the public interest? I would argue that it is in the public interest because the Catholic Church, the development of sex scandals within the Catholic Church has been all about cover-ups and all about people complaining within channels within the Catholic Church and those complaints being ignored priests being moved on, priests being part. In fact, that was the reason that the priests came to the journalist who came to us, because they feared that exactly the same thing was going to happen to Cardinal O'Brien, and he was going to effectively, these complaints would be suppressed, their complaints, and he would be retired in somewhere near Rome and to reflect, and nothing would happen and he wouldn't be held to account. So 
in, that, in the case of that story, I thought the public interest was clear. You know, these were private complaints, private communications, private responses from the papal nuncio back to the priests. But we brought them into the public sphere, I would argue, in the public interest. But it's always a question of judgment in those cases. Anyone else? Yeah, and they're doing, I mean, if you remember the, one of the first graphs kind of went all the way from the Frankfurt Allgemeine to El Pais, et cetera, USA Today. Across the board, papers and across Europe are you know, experiencing the same trends in circulation, print advertising. They're also trying to do the same things, like spoke about The Guardian trying to go to thinking of America as this massive market which if you could get such a volume of online traffic there, then surely digital advertising would follow, uh, you know, real money. Um, El Pais are trying exactly the same thing. Obviously, Spain's got a big relationship with Latin America, and the language is Spanish. And so El Pais is attempting to do a kind of El Pais Latin America in, for exactly the same reason. So across the board, you've seen the same problems and the same kind of attempted solutions with no final solution in kind of sight, really. Yeah. Uh, there was a question from Twitter um, I wanted to be asking. Uh, you've got a Twitter account. There's only a history one tweet on it. You yeah. Account, There's a Twitter account, and I don't use it very much, no. In fact, uh, well, my job is to kind of clarify what I actually do. I'm the news editor of The Observer, the print edition. So on Saturday, there's a separate digital team that comes in and does the kind of Observer online. So I mean, I edit the home section, the foreign section, and the focus section in print. And that's kind of enough for me to be getting on with, I think. So no, I haven't cultivated a Twitter persona <laughs> as yet, but I'm, I may be forced to. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, another uh, question from Twitter. What would it mean to lose newspapers completely, i.e. in terms of tradition and standard of news? Sorry, say that again. What, what, would it what would it mean to lose newspapers completely, basically, in terms of tradition mm. and standard of news? No, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I mean, I think, I think that you'd lose quite a lot. One of the big problems with the online world, we've gone kind of through the many advantages and exciting things about it. But when people are going in to basically click on what they're interested in, so you go in very quickly to a site, I don't know, you're interested in Manchester United's latest result, you go in, read the report, then you go out. To what extent are you actually engaging with The Guardian, so if you've gone to The Guardian, as a total product? The way newspapers worked was almost a world view. This piece of paper or these pieces of paper represent, they talked about the arts, they talked about politics, they talked about theatre, they talked about sport, uh, they talked about science, they had editorials, they had comment pieces. It was a world view in kind of 30 pages or whatever it would have been. And if you bought that paper, you might, I would turn to the sports pages and read the Manchester United report maybe first. But then I'd read other stuff that I was interested in. On the way, I'd probably find other stuff that I was interested in, which I hadn't even thought of looking at. And that would fit into a Guardian presentation of the world that day. Similarly, you'd get different representations of the world that day, say from the Times. Times always historically the paper of the establishment. You'd get a conservative worldview. Obviously, with the Guardian, you'd get a liberal worldview. With the Daily Telegraph, you'd get a slightly more right-wing conservative view, maybe. What's going to happen to those platforms for visions of the world when you've got a completely disaggregated world in which people go in, go there, then come out, then go there, don't stay in any place for any particular period of time? Where are worldviews formed? I think that's a problem that's developed. Well, I don't understand quite how that's going to work out in the on online world. Anyone else?
All right. Well, th thanks a lot. <laughs>